Hey, Josina, thank you for coming in today. You've got a marvelous career. You've done some wonderful contributions to the world and to your community and your region. So again, thank you for coming in and sharing your insights with our audience. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for having me. I feel very honored. So Josina, there's always inflection points in people's lives, and it could have been something that happened when there were you know, three or five, maybe something happened in school, maybe a friend or a family member, and then later on in their life and career, uh, there's these inflection points that really made you who you are today. Okay. So can you talk about some of them? Yeah, wonderful. The interesting thing is, um, you know, when my career, which has basically, basically been in the technology space, uh, the, the first interest for that happened when I wrote my space law thesis at Leiden University, because I wrote my thesis on um, uh, the, the international legal, legal applications uh, concerning remote sensing of the Earth from outer space. Um, and, and thinking back on choosing that specific topic, topic made me realize what I missed about uh, when I was a little girl in uh, kindergarten and primary school, I always used to be such a uh, curious and investor, investigative child and I wanted to know everything and I was like a sponge and soaking up and we had this wonderful library at the school and I think I was the the the, the learner who most of all learners in the classroom would say, no, but I, I want to do a presentation. I, I let me write the uh, 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 do this poem and let me organize the play. And what that thesis brought to me, uh, I realized that my high school years and the first years of my law study actually had been a lot about just absorbing knowledge, but within a confined space. You know, this is the curriculum, this is the content you need to get to know. And there wasn't a lot of room for exploration and curiosity or creativity. And choosing a subject for my thesis, which was completely out of the realm of ordinary law topics, but looked it into what's happening in outer space, and how technology in outer space actually can contribute to things that are happening uh, on the planet made me realize that I missed uh, being that girl from primary school who was curious and, and who was uh, willing to push boundaries and then see what you can do with, with uh, that knowledge that you obtain. So I think, yes, thinking back to that girl, um, that's wonderful. And, and I think the rest of my career and life has, has been uh, following that trajectory since, always looking for new opportunities, exploring different uh, specialist fields, and then realizing, well, actually, I'm not a specialist. Maybe I'm more of a generalist. And then moving on to the next. Obviously, also my move to South Africa from the Netherlands was a big uh, exploration in itself. Excuse me. So um, I'm curious then, you have this uh, thesis and it sort of triggers memories when you're younger and there's curiosity that you had and, and continue to have and the wonderful work that you do. So when you were young, uh, was it sort of innate? It's like other members of your family were like you, sort of curious about all sorts of things or you, or you were you an outlier, different in that in the family? Different, different, yeah. yes. So, and sometimes I, I know I scared my mother at times with that, you know, being this, you know, one of her catchphrases was, why can't you be like other children? Because she didn't really know. I've got this child, this precocious child, and all the teachers say, oh, she's smart. Oh, she's curious. Oh, and she didn't know how to how to really uh, deal with that. I, I don't come from a family where I, I was the first in my family to go to university. So uh, that was all, um, yeah, new to them and, and scary, more scary to them than it was for me, yeah. So when you were young then, were you curious about 
uh, nature and art and music and science and math, and just everything? Or were there some things that excited you more than other things? That's a good question. So I loved uh, reading stories, uh, jokes, but it's, it was learning about the world, I think, most of it. So our library was called at the primary school, it was a world orientation center where you can <laughs> could find information about, it was like a sort of an encyclope encyclopedia. So it was really looking up other countries, but also what do whales do and and the giant panda but also how how does the heart work and 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 lungs yeah yeah lots lots and lots of different uh topics that uh, piqued my interest were there any topics that didn't pique your interest things that you thought no i don't like that subject mm, i wasn't a a big fan of math, but I could also have fun with it. So yeah, it's I, th I think it, yeah, math was less of an uh, interest to me. So then you have all of this curiosity, and, and, you're, and you're an anomaly in the family, and people are wondering, "Gee, she's just so curious," <laughs> and and uh, probably that curiosity has a lot of energy. And that energy drove you then into studying what kind of subjects when you went to university. Yes, yeah, so so for me it was always balancing a bit. What happened in in high school was, you know, you, you follow the curriculum, a bit bored, and then suddenly you realize you have to choose. You know, what what <laughs> am I going to study? And then with this wide imagination and interest. It's actually hard to choose something, and also with with quite a lot of talents uh, at my disposal. So the reason I chose law is actually horrible. At that time on TV, we had LA Law. You probably remember it, <laughs> and I remember those lawyers standing in front of a jury, and I thought, no, I can do that. I'd like to do that. You know, put put forward a case and be convincing and find out what's happening in there. And that's actually why I chose to, to study law. Um, and, and that's the thing that my father was a bit concerned about because although he didn't really know how to deal with me, he was always very <laughs> in, in, intrigued by me and thinking, no, th this child has got potential. And he even discussed it with my high school uh, mentor, where he said, she's choosing law. Isn't that too generalistic for, for, for a child so um, talented as my daughter is? And that mentor said, it, it doesn't really matter what Josine is going to do. Whatever she chooses, she will, she will uh, find her own way and, and come out on, on top and, and using it for her. And law in itself, you know, it's a good foundation to have. It helps you with analytical thinking and so. But like I said, after a couple of years studying, you know, civil law and penal law and all the boring stuff, uh, <laughs> I then specialized in international law and, and uh, most specifically international public law. And that's when you get to talk about um, uh, concepts like the law of the seas uh, and uh, what well, space law, air law, and the fascinating concepts of uh, common heritage of mankind. When we talk about the open seas or about Antarctica or about outer space and the moon. And that somehow really, really triggered my imagination. And it was also things are happening there. And, and you know, if you talk about uh, what's happening in space, technology is being developed and activity is being deployed there for which we actually haven't got laws yet. So this is sort of uncharted territory. And then how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that what's happening there? Uh, and, and that I found more fascinating than learning, you know, which articles in the in the law would speak in a specific civil case or in a penal case. 
So I, I, I ended my university studies on a high note with that thesis. So just one sort of more question, because, you know, I come from North America and on our, and you know, when you go into law, you normally get an undergrad, an undergraduate degree in something. And, and then you go into law school. So it's just like a two part process. You get a degree mm -hmm. in economics and commerce or something like that. Then you end up with going to law school for uh, several years and, and uh, you, you article and so on. And there's just sort of process. It's quite a long process. Is it like that in Europe or describe what it does to be a lawyer in Europe? Yeah, so in, in the Netherlands, that's a bit different. And to be honest, I've, I've never practiced as a lawyer in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, but the law studies, you do start after, so you, you start at age uh, 18. So, so high school is until uh, you're 18. So that's uh, grade 12, I think. For you and then you immediately choose or at that time i know it's changed now but this was um over over 30 years ago you would choose you know you study law so then you just have law subjects and then uh you know you've got your propadaza which is your first year which you have to uh, graduate so that's only one year and then you can continue and then after a couple of years or two years you can choose your specialization so you can be become a fiscal lawyer or yes and obviously if you want to become a lawyer practicing law then after you've graduated your law degree then you will have to go in an internship in a law firm and like you uh to do what you probably call, you know, write your articles and before you become a member of the bar. Yeah. Interesting. Um, uh, you know, all these differences around the world. So, okay. Mm. So you, you go into this international public law and then you specialize in this, or at least part of the time you specialize in the space aspect, right? And, mm. and can you, can you describe some of the sort of intriguing things that you found about space law and, and how, uh, and what are things that we should be concerned about now and going into the future? Well, so the most interesting thing about space law is, is that the main concept is that because space is common heritage of mankind, you know, all exploitation should be done for, for the benefit of all of mankind. And I think that's something that we've, uh, you know, over the last couple of years uh, are, are no longer taking into account. And I must say, probably 30 years ago, 40 years ago, also other things happened, but it was a lot less um, intensive than, than what's happening now. But if, for example, if I look at my uh, uh, thesis, which was looking at remote sensing, what was interesting there is that, you know, any country can launch a remote sensing satellite. You know, there are some uh, rules around it is that you, you report it to a, a certain office at the United Nations. This is the activities that we're going to do, but it doesn't, there are no really rules that guide what you do with that remote sensing satellite. But we have to remember that remote sensing satellites actually take pictures of the earth. And on the Earth, there's a different law system in place than there is in outer space. Because you take pictures of uh, the territories of countries. And on Earth, you know, we've got this concept called state sovereignty. So you can't just, for example, fly over another country without having permission. But now from outer space, you can suddenly take photos of the territory of another country. So that's where, you know, the whole uh, uh, crux comes in that certain countries became very concerned about it because obviously, and this was at the time where we still had, you know, the Eastern Bloc and the socialist countries and developing countries as opposed to the uh, developed nations who did have the capability to put up uh, remote sensing satellites. And they were concerned, you know, if you take photos of what's happening in my country, you have the capability to see, for example, what 
uh, subterranean riches you can find there. So especially African country with all our, you know, the rich resources that can be found there. And what are you going to do with the data? So it's that was the interesting, that's what really piqued my interest. Outer space is free. On Earth, we've got state sovereignty. And actually, you, the activity doesn't remain in outer space because the, the, the data from the activities of the remote sensing satellite are being sent down to Earth, to the ground stations. And, and then what do you do with the data that you get from there? So, so yeah, for me, that was a very interesting uh, topic to explore. And and because you got this sort of uh, background and but you you know moved into other areas as well um but when you reflect back with what you learned at that time and you see what's happening now with commercialization of space and you see the geopolitical tensions that are occurring you see that uh, the moon is being reinvestigated again by many countries not just the absolutely. us absolutely uh, India, for example, you see um, Mars as part of this sort of equation today. There's this concern that maybe the Earth isn't a habitat that can continue for a length of time. And, and it's kind of some people believe now we have to look at other options. There's more than one space station up there. And there's geopolitical divide into who can use, uh, you know, like, who's invited to a space station and so on. There's this idea of asteroids and mining asteroids, and they've even taken a sample of an asteroid and brought it back to Earth. There's um, this whole idea of, of space, uh, existential threats from space, a, a comet mm. or some kind of object hitting the Earth, and really thinking now, what does that mean? And is there ways that we can forestall or or prevent some kind of catastrophe happening on Earth. So now it's changed so much and there's so much space capability and, and commercial space companies. What's your opinion on all of that? In in a way concerning. So so if I yeah. if I if I look at it, you know, from from almost a philosophical point of view, I feel like you know, we we are not able, you know, to make it work on Earth. You know, <laughs> we don't abide by international law. Uh, we've got geopolitical tensions. We still exploit, you know, poorer countries and poorer people. And, you know, if, if with that attitude, and, and, and obviously, you know, only people who've got money to do that can go into outer space. If we take that attitude into outer space, well, I, I don't feel that that whole peace, peaceful use of space, of outer space, that, that you know, opened my heart when, when I learned about it, that, that we're going to be able to, to maintain that in, in any shape, way or form, apart from, you know, accidents that will probably happen due to you know the busyness in the in the geostationary orbit and you know there was the funny funny incident happening last week of the astronaut losing his toolkit but you know th there can be collisions and parts of satellites can come crashing down to earth and we can't protect ourselves against that so, so apart from those accidents, it's also the intentions that that we as human beings take in outer space uh, is is what mostly concerns me. Because because you know, as much as I'm for you know pushing my own boundaries and learning more, um, it's it's always you know do do no harm. You know, the concept of do no harm. Um, we probably have to think about um, do we do harm if if we start to explore and exploit Mars or the Moon or send more commercial aircraft into into space and and is that where our attention should go you know while there's all these if if imagines that's what I sometimes think 
imagine if all the ingenuity that people put in these exploits, they would put towards uh, solving uh, world problems. What would happen to those world problems? And and I never really understand what what that what that drive is. Huh? What makes you decide uh, to put your money and in, in your skills and your talent in your ingenuity behind that? And maybe in the far future we will find out that they were right and Earth has exploded and they were the founders of new colonies on on the moon and Mars, I don't know. You know, globally it's also, and especially in North America, there's this sort of reawakening that these uh, um, unidentified area phenomena, there's something, mm -hmm. they don't know what it is, but they, they think it's real now, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 space will have some connection with it, perhaps, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, so it goes it's almost, Congress. Yeah. There's an ambition <laughs> yeah. that there's something. Right. Yes. I don't know what it is, but there's an addition. But isn't that like the old maps, you know, the old explorer maps where, you know, parts of Earth that hadn't been discovered yet and and the, the maps would just say, here will be sharks or here will be <laughs> dragons, you know. So parts of space or the universe that we don't know yet, th there will be, yeah unidentified flying objects and they might be space sharks or space dragons. Right, it, it, and perhaps they have a perspective of, of us and what we're doing in space, whatever they are, <laughs> if there is a Exactly, day. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, and they would be curious as well, maybe concerned. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, for them, for them, maybe we are the, you know, we are the sharks and the dragons. That's right. We're the scary ones, right? Mm. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're you're in the Netherlands, and and my perspective of people from the Netherlands, they're very practical, and uh, and sometimes it's a bit of a, it's kind of like a joke, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe blunt sometimes, or or straightforward, right? Yes, and and you come from the, from that society, very practical, and I can see why in the family that you they'd be questioning about you because you're thinking in such a big, expansive way, and and there then there can be a little bit of tension because they're you're practical, or there's that practicality of mm -hmm. that region, or that's my perspective as a North American who does mm -hmm. a lot of things in mm -hmm. Europe, mm -hmm. and then. You end up in South Africa. How did that happen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I get asked this more often, and and there's a very long answer, and there's a shorter <laughs> answer. But um, what happens? So I had this lovely career at KPN, corporate career, and like you said, Dutch is very practical, and it's also <laughs> very it's very direct, and. I think my parents were happy because I did my law studies and I finished them and I started a corporate career. And then you're because you're, you're sort of expected to to walk this path. And, you know, and then your friends and they get married and they get babies. And I was like, yeah, hmm. I'm happy for them. I'm not sure if that's what I want. Um, I, I enjoyed the work that I did. And then I went on a holiday to South Africa. So th the job I did at the time at KPN uh, was manager of product development of fiber to the home. So remember, this is 20 years ago. So this was one of the innovation departments. And, and I thought it quite fascinating, you know, working with the network architects and the network engineers who were frustrated with marketing because they couldn't anyway. So I was the lovely interlocutor between technical and marketing. But I went on holiday to South Africa by myself, but in a group, but I was by myself. And from the moment I landed at um, Johannesburg Airport, I don't know, something something happened. It it's it in hindsight, it felt like I was home. I don't know. There's there some there some calm came over me. Like, oh, okay. Oh, 
okay. And I had that feeling during the whole journey. And I had one, yeah, I can say I had an epiphany in, in not in South Africa itself, um, inside South Africa, what Lesotho. So part of the trip took us to Lesotho, uh, to a very high, on a very high mountain. There's a backpacker's lodge called uh, Malea Lea. And it's one of the most beautiful places on earth I've ever seen. But it's also one of the poorest places I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it was a Saturday and we were there as a tour group. And because the tourists who come there basically sponsor the school in the village, on a Saturday morning, we're gonna pay a visit to the school. And now all the children had to come to school on a Saturday because the tourists were there. <laughs> and we went into the classroom and it was all lovely and interesting, but I couldn't, what happened there, you know, my fellow tourists started handing out pens and these children started saying, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for our school. And I thought, no, I, th this isn't right. This doesn't seem right with me. So I had to go outside sitting, you know, yeah, it was really, <laughs> it's, it sounds very dramatic, sitting on a mountain top okay. and, and thinking, you know, thinking something is, is out of whack here. You know, I... I never chose to be born in the Netherlands. You know, that was, that's what happened. These children didn't choose to be born on, in this, on this beautiful mountaintop in Lesotho with no opportunities whatsoever. And I'm in the Netherlands with all the privileges and opportunities. So why are we sitting here and are these children thanking us for so that because they can go to school education is a basic human right you shouldn't have to thank anyone for that it's a basic human right it should be there and that's where I, I had sort of the insight you know with all my curiosity and my skills and my analytical skills and the management skills I've now got maybe you know there's a purpose to this world that says, you know, people with skills and talents and everything actually need to use them for areas where those skills and talents aren't yet, instead of the work that I was doing in the Netherlands, which was, you know, developing uh, new products and services for KPN, the telco I worked for, to even make more money out of clients that we already have, you know, that's pumping money around. Is that a purpose? Is that purposeful uh, work? So, so that was one of the things where I thought, well, that's actually interesting. Apart from the fact that, you know, because you need to find a reason to make it acceptable to people that you move. Because just saying no, but I felt yeah. like I came home, <laughs> yeah. is 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 much more difficult for people for people to grasp. So. Yeah, it took me, I, I, I went back uh, to the Netherlands after the holiday and I became very, yeah, I think it was sort of uh, existential crisis, you know. So, so what am I doing in this life? And there is so much more uh, to do in the world. And also I wanted to explore why, why do I feel at home in South Africa? What is it there for me? So if it took me less than a year to get it organized. So I took an opportunity at KPN. They were doing retrenchments. They wanted to keep me, but then I had to promise not to talk about South Africa anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I said that, so, what, so what, what if I want to keep talking about South Africa, but then I would be part of the program for China. And not because I talked about South Africa, but because I chose not to do the job. Uh, and I took that package and that allowed me to facilitate uh, my two first exploration trips to South Africa and I pretty quickly got some consulting work. So I packed everything and I moved and that was the beginning. Yeah. And, and yeah, and an interesting move, like you said, coming from practical, yeah, you said blunt, direct, um, it can, yeah, can be very direct and, and blunt to South Africa, which is much more gentle and, 
uh, yeah, it was a, I don't know, yeah, I don't exactly know why I did it, but I, it was one of the best things I've had ever done. You felt some kind of a synchronicity and harmony when you went to South mm. Africa, a oneness with that region and the people mm. and the and the culture and the history, which you didn't really find where you were. That's kind of the sense I get, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And that oneness, that harmony, that synchronicity, that unity, that integration that happened when you landed and then um, went to South Africa. So what did you do? I mean, you had to work. So what did you do? Yeah, so I thought, because at the time there was talk of a second national operator. So I thought, no, let, let me continue my corporate career, but in a, in a South African corporate. But to be honest, uh, making that move by myself and I had my own business cards printed and I thought, no, 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 I like being this independent. Why, why would I... Uh, become part of another corporate you know I, I was never unhappy in a corporate but it wasn't the optimal environment for me so but let me let me see if I can get to work as an independent consultant so yeah through just phoning people and uh, that that's a good thing about being Dutch <laughs> you, you find your way <laughs> into places um I very quickly um, had a, a first consulting job with MTN, which is uh, one of the, the the main mobile operators. So it was a strategy consulting job and a second job uh, with the Department of Communications, which was looking at uh, how do we get internet to all the schools uh, in South Africa. So it was also a strategy job. So yeah, working as a consultant, that's that's how I started. And, you know, so that would mean, like you said, um, your Dutch background, you're, you're not afraid to pick up the phone or make that cold mm. call and say, hey, this is who I am. Uh, I worked in telecommunications in Europe and, and I have skills that will be of value to you. And mm. these are the things I can do. And you, you end up getting hired. And so what were the initial challenges when you uh, worked as a consultant and you're putting internet through schools? Because putting internet or working in the mobile environment, there's just going to be differences in South Africa versus working in fiber optics in Europe. So can yeah, you describe yeah. those differences and, and what you learned? Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, um, I, I quickly learned to um, observe before I spoke. <laughs> well that's different than usually for dutch right Cause... yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah, but but you know what but but i in immediately made some some mistakes because things are different and like i said yeah. people are much more gentle and it's and to be honest i looked you know it offered me what i was looking for in the netherlands you know so my my bosses at kpn would sometimes say yeah you're great at the job you do and you can really go very far but you are a bit emotional you know you need to get that in check and then i thought but no you know i should get my emotional side in check or maybe you should open up to that a bit more so right. um i really enjoyed having that a bit more emotional side because remember when i came to south africa it was it was just nine ten years after the first democratic elections so um the uh all the, the trauma of of the struggle was, was still very much it, it actually still is but especially then was still very much there but it's also i don't know it, it's it's sort of it opens people up and the conversations you get in, I'll never forget those first meetings I would be in. Because if you then start talking about how important it is to get internet into schools, the, the mobile operators were mostly uh, black owned with black personnel. So it was all new and it was all so geared towards doing things uh, for good. 
Right. So I feel now this is really, really, uh, you know, where I'm at home. But it also meant, you know, treading uh, carefully because, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a white woman. I'm a woman that makes it a bit easier, but I'm white and I'm not from South Africa. So that might make right. things easier. But people don't immediately, you know, know that when they look at you. So <clears throat> it's it's. And I thought I would have to be more careful with that, but people were actually very welcoming and bring your skills and we need them and how how can we work with that? So it's a completely, um, it was a much more conducive environment uh, for how I wanted to work. But then obviously there's also a difference between working at a mobile operator or working at a, a government department because uh, that's the corporate environment and that already started to feel a bit more like corp the corporate I knew in the Netherlands uh, whereas at government level there was even more than at the corporate a much more drive towards we need to get all the people uh, on board and included and it's um it was a tough challenge then um, and it's it, it's a, a, t a tough challenge today still because we haven't figured it out yet after 20 years in South Africa. But it would be uh, a tough challenge, but an exciting, energizing, inspiring challenge because you said, like you said, it's for good, right? Yes, yes. And then, and, but then still... You know, it's also, so I remember the, 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 the strategy I wrote for the Department of Communications is saying from the get-go, you don't do this by yourself, you know, because then there's talk about we need to start our own operator. No, no. Get your public-private partnerships going because, you know, including everyone and educating everyone is not just the public good, but it's also in the interest of these businesses. Mm -hmm. Because how can you be sustainable in the longer term without a population that has the skills that you will need to keep on growing your business and to keep innovating? And apart from, but also uh, with clients who know how to work with the products and the increasingly innovative products that you, that you build and bring to market. So we need to look at public-private partnerships and uh, see how we can make that happen. Because you, as government, you've got a public, you know, you've got your public objectives that you need to fulfill. And uh, companies, because at KPN, I also worked in, in uh, Eastern Europe where, where KPN uh, went to. And there the governments would always say, you can buy the mobile license, but that comes with the responsibility to also connect rural areas so that's the universal service obligations that came into it so so how do you balance all of that but it you know sometimes i find it surprising that for businesses this feels like tasks that they have to complete you know a universal service um, obligation to connect the unconnected or to have specific rates so for schools we were talking about an e-rate where schools would be connected to the internet at lower rates than the commercial rates. And I thought, you know, education is, is so relevant <laughs> to having a thriving economy, you know, for the benefit of us all. So, yeah, no, it's it's very exciting, but it's also, it's a, it's a very long-term uh, project. So the excitement comes and goes. <laughs> <laughs> As does the frustration, yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 people don't say you're too emotional. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. Isn't that wonderful, no. right? <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, you're even, you know, you're, you're more being blamed for being too, you know, too businesslike. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so and I learned a lot. Eh? So I, I, it's lovely how you say that that in the Netherlands, you know. And I think that's part of of being an immigrant in a in another country. And I chose I chose to come here, 
um, where you, you look back at your own country and you think, no, everything, all these things are much better in South Africa and I wish I was born here. But at some point there's also this balance where you think, no, but actually the Netherlands has given me so much and um, all this practicality and bluntness and uh, critical thinking. I think that that's a very Dutch trade where yeah. <laughs> we're being taught in critical thinking, you know, and, and now it's it's touted as one of 21st century skills. And I think, well, critical thinking is is what what we what I have learned in the Netherlands, not just in school, but also in the corporate environment. So one of the differences between the Netherlands and South Africa was that if I would present something in a in a management meeting in the Netherlands, well, before you'd finish talking, people would start, you know, <laughs> but what about this? And did you think that's not gonna work? That? <laughs> that's not gonna work. And how about da, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> and in South Africa, and I and I presented to to the executive management and I presented. So I was, and in a way I like it because you know all these questions because it 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 elevates the work that you're doing because you bring in different perspectives and it keeps you sharp and i presented in south africa and they just thanked me for my presentation <laughs> and i was like yeah, but don't you have questions um so at, at that point of you know i i missed the mark you know what i've presented to them doesn't speak uh to to what they want to know but then afterwards i got feedback i thought no this is but but uh, you know for me that felt a bit like a missed missed opportunity so that critical thinking skills you know and it made me think about that over the past few years when we thinking talking about how important it is to teach children critical thinking skills i think you actually I've been told that, and in the Netherlands, it's flipped from critical thinking into judgmental thinking. So you know, it's th there's a fine balance between being analytically uh, sharp and then attaching a judgment to it to, to things that you see. But th the skill in itself is a very useful one to have. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, maybe a critical thinking in this terms. Um with with a theme of optimism hmm. so you look you look at potential challenges and barriers and then you could get very solution oriented and optimistic exactly. that we could overcome exactly. this yes definitely definitely that's you know that's fascinating so can you talk about some of this work uh, things that uh, you you want to get internet everywhere. You're working with the Department of Education and things like that. Can you can you go into more detail of some of these things that you're doing, and and where yeah. you feel it's it's a ten out of ten, and other words are like an eight, and so more work to do. It's not you know it doesn't mean it's it's bad or not, or failed. It just means it's just more work to do. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. So so if I it, very. Um, history of the work, the work in education, and 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 what I'm doing now, and what I see, what what needs to happen uh, going forward is, um, so so when I did that first consulting job at the Department of Communications, I worked with somebody, um, Tobeli Tengem Fena. I really want to mention him here. We unfortunately lost him during COVID, but he moved from. Department of Communication to Vodacom, one of the other main big oper mobile operators in uh, South Africa, and he moved to the foundation. So he became responsible for their corporate social responsibility program. And then he found me. So he, he worked there for a year and then he found me, he said, Josina, uh, what, what we've come up with at the department, the public-private partnership, I've got it in place and now I need you to do it for me. So then I came in as a consultant at Vodacom uh, and we set up the Vodacom mobile education program, which involved setting up um, teacher centers, district teacher development centers in every district. And there's 145 uh, education districts in South Africa and outfit those uh, teacher district uh, development centers with computer centers. 
And that, that was a public-private partnership with Department of Basic Education, Vodacom, Microsoft, Intel, uh, but Vodacom was the, the driver behind it and the integrator of the whole program. So the, the you know it started with challenges where I said now let's let's start with one center in each of the provinces and the whole and and that worked so but that was a bit of a long haul and then because then you find out if national department says yes doesn't mean that the provinces and the districts know about it so that's more uh, but but that's what other people were responsible for but we were looking at how we're we going to set up these programs so we came up with programs where we said uh, we need to have connectivity we need to have infrastructure so that's computers laptop tablets whatever we need we need to have digital content and um, teacher training and those were the four pillars that uh, the program was based on and i'm actually very proud of of what we achieved there because we moved from nine centers in the first year to 92 centers a couple of years later there really was a good program around it. Um, and yeah, things that worked didn't work is um, connectivity remains a problem in, in rural areas. So even if centers are connected, doesn't mean they have broadband connectivity because the operators haven't made that available yet. Um, We've got challenges with security. So outfit a lovely computer center and uh, the criminals in the area will know about it soon. So uh, these centers come under attack. Um, most amazing thing, I think, is the people that work in these centers. I always find, you know, we sit in Joburg, we come up with all these ideas for programs and then you come into the... Uh, rural areas and find out what actually what we've come up with doesn't really work but by working with people who do work on the ground so the department has e-education specialists and e-learning specialists and center managers and if you work with those that that uh, cross-pollination really worked well you know it's 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 never the uh, enthusiasm and drive and passion of people on the ground because they want, I, I've fallen in love with teachers uh, during this project and people who work in education because they work with a passion. They say, no, we need to prepare our children because if we don't, it's going to fall. And what I've learned is that the difficulty with if, if education becomes a corporate social responsibility project, it's, it also has a lot of, because they have to spend that money, you know, those are legal obligations, um, but it's also a branding marketing, you know, branding PR issue. And uh, the, the attention span is sometimes shorter than you need for a project to really succeed. And the budgets that, are allocated to it are not uh, big enough to really make it work. Because uh, even if you have these, these four pillars ready, the connectivity, infrastructure, content, and teacher training, it doesn't mean it flies. You know, it needs a lot of attention and hand-holding. And especially when you look at the, the teacher training, you know, it, it's we say we give you once of training and then we expect you to go back into the classroom and actually do it. It doesn't work like that. We we also don't work like that. If if you've learned something new, it takes some time and going back and forth and how do we fix it? So, so that's also why I, five years ago, established my company, Flying Cows of Josie, because I said, this is the missing link in, in what we do in education. So Flying Cows of Josie are recently graduated teachers who've specialized in ICT in education and who act as coaches for teachers. So instead of big ones of training programs, we need to have a lot of more, you know, ongoing hybrid models of face-to-face -face webinars, WhatsApp support, and understand how the technology integrates in the curriculum. You know, are there pedagogical strategies that are at the heart 
of what we're bringing into the classroom. Because otherwise, you you don't want to know how many, I call them the digital white elephants. You know, we've got beautiful ele elephants in South Africa, but we've got plenty of digital white elephants, which are computer centers in schools, which are not being used because people, um, there's not, it's not a lack of willingness, but they don't know how to. And that's a bit my next drive maybe let me not call it a frustration let me call it my next drive is to is to make clear you know we talk these days about human centered technology but then we must also be willing to pay for the human beings to bring the technology to other human beings so if we look at the edtech industry and i've tried to participate in a couple of those you know incubator funds for edtech companies and the first thing they say, so what's your platform? What's your app? What's your? I said, no, I'm not bringing more technology. We're not going to solve the problem in education by throwing even more technology at it. I think there are brilliant ed tech solutions out there, but as long as we don't, or if if we don't want to invest in the human beings, you know, getting to integrate and actively use these ed tech applications in the classroom, we're just going to be, you know be creating more digital white elephants. So th there's this sort of mind shift that I think needs to happen that, that, that I'm trying to drive where you say, yes, I believe in technology. Yes, I believe in technology for good and environmentally conscious technology. But if we talk about human centered, you know, we need to look a bit further than just looking at, you know, do we, uh, abide by the human rights? Uh, do we protect uh, people from misinformation? But we need to train people properly and we need to pay the people who train the people to do that. So it's actually investing in human beings working in, in ed tech. You know, we're, we're down to the last few minutes. In fact, um, mm. uh, we've got a, about two minutes left and there's so, <laughs> so much more I could talk to you about. So let's talk about what you're doing with the Institute of Information Technology Professionals of South Africa. So, because you 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 are um, a director on the board and you mm. you chair. So can you talk about some of the work there? And then one final question after that is, what's your recommendation to the audience? So you got two oh. minutes, probably. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, it's good that I like challenges. No, so so the work on the the board. So I first came, uh, I became was a voluntary member uh, of the institute in the social ethics committee, uh, where we worked at getting the uh, IFIP code of ethics uh, slightly adapted for the South African circumstances. So the fascinating thing about uh, the IITPSA, so Institute for IT Professional in South Africa, is. You know, like in most countries, we've got an ICT skills gap, but I think our, our gap is a bit bigger than uh, probably in the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, what can we do as an institute to contribute to, to creating awareness around that in the industry? Because it's great that we look after IT professionalism and that, that you know, people who come into the country with critical skills visas, um, are, are edu educated by the Institute, but we also have a role to play in, in creating awareness in the country on the uh, dearth of ICT skills and what can we do as an industry to work with that. And my role in the Social and Ethics Committee was really looking at, so I love sharing it, saying, how can we create awareness uh, an education around the code of ethics because ethics is like oh boring and to be honest uh, you know for most people you know you don't want to be bogged down in the development work you do by talk about things you know have you taken this into account um and i think you know our task has become easier with the enormous emergence of ai ethics suddenly everybody's talking about ai ethics so there we try to um, create awareness by having webinars where where, where we uh, combine. So we talk about blockchain and we say green blockchain. So, um, I, you know, one of our ethics committee comes on board with a specialist on blockchain. We talk about responsible AI. So that's the work we do at the uh, at the institute. 
Um, and, and so what we're doing this year is looking at how can we have a much better ICT skills study uh, in South Africa, where we're not only looking at the demand side, but also what's happening at the, at the supply side in ICT skills. So, okay, how much, how, how, how much Richard. longer have I got left? <laughs> So you got about 30 seconds. One, one recommendation. 30 seconds. So <laughs> one recommendation. recommendation. To the audience, yeah. And I want to congratulate you on the David O'Leary Award, a global award. Yes. From IFIP, no, IP3 of yeah. professionalism. So, but yes. one final. It was wonderful. Yes, actually, yeah, just taking it back to what I spoke about earlier. So uh, if you work in digital technology and, and you want it, to be a sustainable, want to be it sustainable for the future. Let's make it purposeful and invest in human beings working in technology. Yes. So thank you so much for coming in. I, you know, I could spend a half our day with you. I mean, you just have such fascinating work, and and you're such a great contributor to the global community and your in your region as well. So thank you again for coming and sharing your insights with our audience. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephen. It was really lovely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.